individuals, families, and the communities in where the violence occurs. The impact and the volume of the gun violence in Philadelphia is so severe that we're now in the midst of a public health crisis. The mayor, as you recall, issued a call to action on violence prevention at the end of September and gave us 100 days for his cabinet and his leadership to get a plan on his desk, task that we took to heart and moved as quickly as we could. That set into motion the convening of a very large work group that was an interdisciplinary, interagency work group consisting of most of the leadership of the top city departments who would be involved in this type of work. And over the last few months, that work developed into the report and the plan that some of you now hold in your hands that we call the Philadelphia Roadmap to Safer Communities. It is very much a roadmap. It has very broad goals, overall strategies, and a series of specific recommendations. If implemented, we believe that this plan can dramatically reduce shootings and homicides in the city over the next five years. This is a plan that we have worked very uh, strategically with both the police department, members of the city, the community, and others uh, to try to come up with. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Theron Pry. He's a senior director of the Violence Prevention Office. Uh, his title is specifically around strategies and uh, initiatives and programs. And he's going to walk you through and give everyone sort of a quick review of the roadmap. I know that Mayor Kenny is very much committed to this plan. The government is committed, and we all approach this test with the urgency that is required as we recognize that, uh, unfortunately, people are being shot and or killed uh, on a much too consistent basis. With the support of the community and our partners across the city, we'll achieve our vision for every Philadelphia to be safe from gun violence in their communities, with full access to opportunities to create their path to a fulfilling life. And now, uh, Mayor Jim Kenny will come up with Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, and I'm glad that we have such a large crowd here to discuss our ongoing plans to continue to try to push down this gun violence on the side of our city. Um, it'll be a new approach to tap into one of the most difficult challenges our city faces, the epidemic of violence. Our plan may be new, but this issue is far from it. Violence has unfortunately plagued Philadelphia for generations. We're doing everything we can to change it. These past three years, we've taken big steps to address violence in our communities. We launched the Community Crisis Intervention Program, which deploys prevention teams in neighborhoods that use respected messengers from the very community to intervene and defuse tensions before incidents turn to violence. We've expanded the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership to provide needed supports to young people most at risk of gun violence with the goal of connecting them to more positive experiences. We've invested in more alternatives for incarceration, treatment, and rehabilitative programming through the MacArthur Grant. But despite all of this, clearly more needs to be done. We need a new approach, one that looks at violence through the lens of public health. Last September, I called upon members of our cabinet and senior leadership to place on my desk a plan for how we will dramatically reduce the killings and shootings in our city. We sought to map out a more robust and comprehensive response to violence that focuses on prevention as well as enforcement and reentry. We must get away from the mindset that policing is the only answer to this problem. It was also important that we rely on data and science to identify the most effective strategies to address these issues. As we were developing this plan, I sat down, and we all sat down, with many, many residents who have been deeply impacted by violence in neighborhoods across the city to hear their concerns and their ideas. Based on your feedback and research conducted by the Office of Violence Prevention, we now have a strong set of actionable recommendations present to you today. These recommendations recognize that violence is ultimately a symptom of the larger crisis of pervasive poverty in Philadelphia. They call for addressing the inequities in communities most prone to violence, investing in intelligence-based and community-oriented policing, as well as better supporting the reintegration of formerly incarcerated individuals. We are committed to investing $4.4 million, million, million dollars over the next six months to begin implementation of these recommendations, and that's just the start of funding. I will present our budget to City Council early March. At that time, I will propose a more significant commitment to implementing this plan. And I look forward to continued conversations with Council on these investments as they review the entire budget and the five-year plan. 
We'll soon be hearing all about all of these recommendations in more detail. I want to thank Vanessa Garrett Harley, Theron Pride, and the rest of our team for their hard work in putting this plan together. And I want to thank members of City Council that are here today, especially Council President Clark, Curtis Jones, Deanna Johnson, Bill Greenley, here, but they are all in the forefront of this issue, pushing us every day. We need their support and their wisdom going forward. Now, I'm pleased to accept their findings, their findings, look forward to working with all of our partners to start implementing them as soon as possible. We simply can't wait any longer. One life lost to violence is one too many. I want to thank you, and now we'll hear before we hear from a third to walk us through these, these particular plans. I just want to say that the hundreds of people that we met with in the course of this process, and the moms and dads and brothers and sisters that we heard from, and the heartbreak that they feel that they'll never get over, and the loss of their loved ones, a better woman who lost two sons, uh, and, to, and to listen to their pain, we must commit ourselves to making these young men our children also, as we did when we started our PHL pre-K and our rebuild program. We've taken ownership of all of our young babies to get them where they need to be. Now we need to intervene and get our arms around the young people who resort to violence as a result of just daily interactions, drugs, and other things. Uh, they are our children also. We owe it to them, and we want to see this homicide trend going down as it was up until 2017, uh, and we want to get it back on track, declining, and our ultimate aspirational goal is zero. Uh, and we want to thank you all for all your help. There will be continued interaction with the community through the course of this process. We will have quarterly meetings with stakeholders to get feedback and change and adjust what we do. Uh, but we are committed to this. We are serious about this. We're willing to invest the money necessary to get it done. So I want to thank you all for being here today, and I'll have this third to come up and walk you through. Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Theron Pride, I'm the Senior Director, as the Gosspons mentioned. And I'm honored uh, to have the opportunity to walk you through a 100-day effort that really is an example of the commitment in the city of Philadelphia to end this, not simply prevent and reduce, but to end it, as the mayor said, one life lost to two. This process, though very quick, my experience working previously with the Department of Justice and the Obama administration, this usually took months to do. But everyone in this city came together in a way that I had not seen in other jurisdictions, uh, to partner, to share, to collaborate. And I think this is the first step to many conversations and other action items that we will roll out. So I will take uh, the few moments that I have to cover at a high level of what we talked about in this plan. I certainly encourage you to get a copy to go online, to download it, to look closer at it, to further critique further engage with us in terms of this is the city's plan. We recognize that it's not just the city that has work to do. It's all of us. It's everyone in all the communities in Philadelphia to come together to solve this. This is a problem that impacts all of us. We start off with this roadmap as a way forward, as a first step in a journey of many more steps to come. So with that, I'll go to the first slide in the presentation to just tell you that how we try to define the issue. And I'll be clear with you that I know that when we talk about numbers, the high numbers are real lives. So I don't want to minimize the fact that lives have been lost, and for many of you in the room have been impacted by this. I don't want this to be a cold presentation. But the reality is, we do see that a lot of this violence is happening in communities that have high rates of poverty. The mayor has said this to us repeatedly, that we have got to find a way to address this issue. And the map that you see in this slide, the green dots and yellow, uh, the, the yellow dots and the red dots point out the shootings and the homicides. And then those dark blue, dark purple areas on that map is where poverty is concentrated at the highest. And you'll see in our report that it maps almost perfectly. In terms of where the highest levels of poverty are, there also you find the most homicide shootings. We also found that approximately 75% of those who were shot or who are the ones doing the shooting are black males. And that they're most commonly between the ages of 16 and 34. We also found that the individuals involved in gun violence have obviously complex histories, as many of you know. And a majority have had prior contact with city government and the criminal justice system. All of which, in looking at the problem, tells us there's a real opportunity to get to individuals well before the shooting happens. We meet these folks. We know these individuals. 
partners in law enforcement, with our community partners working with them in um, the organizations that serve the community, with the city agencies that touch these lives, we have an opportunity here to get these individuals much earlier. Let's go to the next slide. So, because we took a look at the data, we tried to understand who is most at risk and who is most affected by this violence. We know it has no bounds in terms of the pain felt, but we were able to identify that these young men, between 16 and 34, largely men of color, are the ones that we should pay special <laughs> attention to. Not that black men are inherently dangerous. Let me be clear. Black men are not inherently dangerous. If you look around this room right now, you see a lot of accomplished black men in this room. But there are young men in our city who, because of the circumstances that they face every day, and the choices, though very difficult, they have to make, find themselves caught up in a cycle of violence. We want to look at the families, the neighborhoods, the neighbors, the service providers that touch the lives of these young people, particularly these young males of color between the ages of 16 and 34. Next slide. So using a public health approach, trying to come with a whole different solution and looking at this population that still needs our help and support, we lay out a vision, a vision that says every Philadelphia will be safe from gun violence in their communities with full access to opportunities to create their path to fulfilling life. It's not enough to have a reduction or prevent gun violence. There needs to be something in place of that. The opposite of gun violence is opportunity. Let me say that again. The opposite of gun violence is opportunity. Where there is opportunity, gun violence has a harder chance to rear and occur. So within that vision, we have four goals. Four goals that guided our work with our partners in community, with our partners across the city. We came up with these large buckets to kind of organize our thinking in terms of how would we achieve this vision of every Philadelphia being safe from gun violence with full access to opportunities. We said there needs to be more connection and thriving youth and young adults in the city. We know that there needs to be stronger community engagement and partnerships. We need to have more coordinated city services and planning. We need to have safer and healthier neighborhoods. Those were some of the key goals that we needed to achieve if we wanted to reach our vision. Next slide. And so within that framework, those four large goals and that vision, we offered up some key recommendations to the mayor, who was very clear that we had to get this done in 100 days. And so we wanted to go back to the mayor and be clear in terms of what we needed, because we know that he was going to hold our feet to the fire if we don't get this done in terms of also implementing it. So we offered key recommendations at the top to say clearly what we have to do at a minimum just to get this to where it needs to be. So first and foremost, we need to promote community health and well-being by prioritizing the reduction of structural violence. It's those things in community that often go unfelt, but you see it, you know it. They impact lives, they harm lives and families. We have to get at the root causes those structures, those institutions that serve as barriers and strengths that people need their basic needs. That's key. We also need to build on the administration's successful criminal justice reforms by improving reentry programs and services. As I said earlier, in defining the issue and looking at the problem, we know people are touched by the criminal justice system before they find themselves a shooter or a victim of homicide. There's a real opportunity for us to improve reintegration so that people are successful and thriving in their communities when they return as one more way, a key strategy in terms of being ahead of this gun violence. And of course, we need to invest in additional analytical capacity and technology to implement what we'll refer to as Operation Pinpoint that Commissioner Ross will talk about a little bit later. But it's key that in prevention, we partner with law enforcement to have a very focused approach on those who are most high risk. And they need the tools to do that pinpoint strategy in regards to who are the individuals we need to be most concerned about. And so building that capacity out, to getting them to a level where they have what they need to better help us focus on where we need to put our limited resources is key. So those are the three key recommendations. Next slide. And so, of course, even with those three, in our report, you'll see that there's further things delineated under each of those three that I mentioned. But we go further. This was a group that was not short on aspiration or ambition. And so we laid out within the four goals broader action items that we also wanted to take. 
And at the top, in those goals that I talked about earlier, we certainly want to see that when we talk about connection and thriving youth and young adults, we want to ensure that young men, in particular, at the highest risk of gun violence, between the ages of 16 and 34, and their families, have a clear path to proven prevention and intervention programs. Those are the people we need to reach. And if we're talking about everyone in this city being connected to the supports they need and thriving, we need to focus on these young men. We also, when we talk about coordination of city services, we need to use police and health and other data to better identify the people and places driving violence in our communities and more effectively target policies, programs, and services to address these issues. As I said before, working with police and our other partners in public health, we want to be able to better use the data we have access to to really identify where best to direct our resources. It's not enough to say everyone is the same thing. There are certain folks who face particular challenges who need additional help, and we need to be able to do that in a very effective way. We also need to invest resources in programs and services and infrastructure that help to promote the safety, health, and wellness of all Philadelphians. If we're going to have safer neighborhoods, we have to make sure, even at a physical level in community, things improve. And we certainly need to increase public awareness of the root causes of gun violence and focus initiatives in communities at the highest risk. If we're going to have strong community engagement and partnership, we need to be working with the community to identify where they see the needs and make sure, again, we're focusing our attention on those areas. So the last slide. I'll close my remarks by saying this ultimately is the illustration of the vision. You see in this picture young men of color graduating with opportunity and promise. You see faces that are bright and smiling. This is where the city of Philadelphia needs to go. This will not happen overnight. We didn't get to here overnight. It will be a long process. If we all work together and come together on following through on this roadmap and bring our resources that we have collectively to this issue. That's the picture we can see on every young person in Philadelphia, including our young men of color. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. All right, so uh, obviously a very serious issue when we deal with each and every day. Philadelphia Police Department, like most police departments, recognizes that there's no singular uh, panacea for the prevalence of or uh, dealing with the prevalence of gun violence on our streets. So that being said, what we're instituting is something that Theron mentioned called Operation Pinpoint, uh, which combines uh, effective elements of community-oriented and intelligence-led policing models uh, that you see all across this nation, many of which that we've employed over the years. Operation Pinpoint is a multifaceted crime-fighting and information-sharing strategy designed to identify, collect, analyze, and disseminate information. Officers and commanders will use this information to target the most violent offenders and the areas most affected by violent crime. Operation Pinpoint integrates all that we know about policing our neighborhoods and in a planned, targeted, and measurable way. Pinpoint combines something you've heard called hot spot policing, offender focus, problem solving, and community policing. Pinpoint utilizes data, technology, and on the ground experience. Pinpoint is a data driven and evidence based, but also includes crucial input from experienced officers and investigators in the field. Information gathered is evaluated in real time and is actionable uh, intelligence is provided to officers and commanders on a daily basis. Field officers will receive pinpoint intelligence from crime analysts before and during their tours. In turn, they will patrol these uh, targeted areas and collect information uh, from their observation, witnesses, community members, and offenders in the areas. Operation Pinpoint will augment our existing crime prevention and response strategies and initiatives, and we believe will have an appreciable impact on gun violence in Philadelphia. So I know you will have questions later, but at this time, I know I'm supposed to call up Councilman Jones and uh, Kenyatta Johnson, but obviously we have the Council President here and Councilman Green. I don't know who else is coming up, so uh, see?
First of all, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for putting together with your staff an outline for addressing this crisis. I often say with my colleagues in chambers, if 300 whales washed up on the shore of the Schuylkill River, every marine biologist in the world would come to Philadelphia to figure out why so many whales had died. We average about 300 murders a year. Right here in Philadelphia, multiply that by the other big cities, you can see this epidemic being built. This is a good start. But let me tell you, this is the, 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 the relationship with the grassroots groups, the law by whom every day I don't answer his calls right away until I look at the news now to see what has happened over the weekend. I used to answer, just want to see you call me. I avoid that now. But let me tell you why. I walk my dog every morning. Captain Jack Jones he is more recognized in my community than me. We walk up a, 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 a corner that I used to stand on at 54th and Euclid. There's a young man at that time of day. He's ending his she was ending his shift, I was beginning my day. And he would look at me when he saw me, he would want to run, but he didn't. He manned up and said, you caught me, I'm here again. And we had a long conversation and all he really wanted, he ran that corner, all he really wanted was a job. He said, this is no fun for me, old head. This is not the kind of life I picked out when I was in middle school, but I don't know what's left for me. While you were writing this report, and I'm glad it's done, that man was shot to death on that same floor. So my colleague and I, about the urgency of time, and this mayor understands we gotta do this now. Because every year, every month that we delay, someone, and often more than one, wind up victims of this. So as we looked at some of these uh, aspects of the program, I'm excited about the potential for them, because it covers the major food groups that if you, the best prevention of gun violence is a job, Mike Jones. I've never met a $50,000 a year gang banger. So as we look at these links in the chain, I see uh, the uh, head of the school district here. He's a part of it. He was there. <laughs> so the school to prison pipeline is real, reentry is real. So he was in that room when I found out that that boy got killed. We were up at, uh, I didn't know you from Winfield, to but I found that out. So yesterday we were doing this, you'll hear. Uh, from Councilman Johnson, we don't watch the news the same way anymore. Between my district, Council President's district, and Jamie Blackwell's district, we watch the news and say, first, we pray for the soul that was taken. And the second thing, we want to know the geography of where it was taken. Because we know we have to do certain things after that. So uh, I'm excited, Mr. Mayor, and I'm thankful. I'll get for the first time in my recollection, um, since State Streets, there is a plan that is coherent. I know when we're talking about a uh, safety the environment, that we are, what, what the three steps we want to do. If you talk about economic development in our chambers, I know what we're going to do. When we talk about education, I know what we're going to do. For the first time in a long time, we have a game plan. It's not perfect. But it's a beginning. Thank you.
in the emergency hour. So I thank the mayor for not only charging his team to come up with a plan, but most importantly stepping up with a budget proposal and the resources to allow us to execute this plan. As Councilman Curtis Jones mentioned, we have community work, community groups organizing on the ground day in and day out, trying to prevent young men from killing one another. But I'm also happy that our commission has resources to make sure we find out where these guns are coming from. No gun factories in Point Breeze or Strawberry Mansion. And so in order for us to reduce this level of crime and violence that we're seeing with the city of Philadelphia, it's going to take all of us to step up to the plate to get involved. After this press conference, we're going to another press conference in South Philadelphia, where we have a Stop the Violence World at Ralph Brooks Top Lot at 20th and Tassel Street. This is a mural that I watched since I've been a young man growing up in South Philadelphia after I lost my own custody of gun violence and started my own organization called Peace Not Guns. But the point is, this mural has about 30 young people who were murdered in the streets of South Philadelphia. And so it's ironic that we're doing this press conference today here to address the same issue I've been dealing with since I've been a young man growing up in South Philadelphia. So, Mr. Mayor, we thank you and your team for stepping up to the plate and the members of City Council. Councilman Clark, he's been focusing on stopping where these guns are coming from. Because as a young man growing up, I remember that you would get a revival. A revolver, a lot. The average young person today carries a 45 AR-15. If we don't get to the bottom of where these guns are coming from, Commissioner, I, I watched on the news the other day some guys outside in the snow and got out and they blazing and shooting like they in some land that's not being regulated. So, from the law enforcement standpoint, sir, we need to find out where these guns are coming from. And let those who shoot and discriminate, because I have two young sons growing up who are African American young men. And I have to recognize as a father, I'm a politician, as a father, their chances of becoming young adults are based upon the job that we do here in the city of Philadelphia that will allow them a chance to follow their goals, their dreams, and their aspirations. So for me, this is not politics. This is something I believe in. I thank everyone for this particular task force and this report, but now we got work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Councilman, you talked about when you were growing up, um, people were able to get revolvers. Um, when I was growing up, people actually had zip guns. They tell me, get back a little way. But I say that to say that the simple reality is this violence is not new. Uh, this violence there will always be some level of violence. Uh, but the level of violence that we're experiencing today is a different type of violence. The man getting shot in the face I mean, last night, because I guess he only had $20. I mean, what is that about? I mean, what is that about? I mean, this is a different breed, man. You know, and I just want to say, I'm glad that you're standing here today at this level and look at the people in this room, cross-section of people. Uh, most people have been talking about this forever. You know, we've had a couple of meetings to discuss on the street presence. We obviously talked about the need to put additional resources uh, for the police department. We talked about the fact that we've got to deal with the underlying problem. There's lack of opportunity. People not having any sense that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, some of this stuff is generational, right? That's the reality. But today we're here, and I'm seeing the level of commitment that we need to make, right? The willingness to do. Um, Mayor, I'm, I'm assuming you know, your uh, budget message will be asking us to ask a little money. No, all right, all right, all right. We'll probably get the appropriate office, and we'll be responsible for winning the votes for that. But the reality is today, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm pleased at the level of commitment that I'm seeing need to understand that this is a comprehensive approach. Uh, there is no one um, entity that can solve this. It has to be everybody in this room. As I look across the room, I see a lot of individuals that have been out there grinding. I see a number of people that are in the enforcement issue, a number of people in the social services working together. I think we can get this done. we got to make it there because at the end of the day,
today, we will never be the city that we think we are until we create a safe community for everybody. So I just want to thank everybody here today. Um, God bless you all. And we'll do it again. And that's important. And that's important. 
and that the resources that come behind it, that city council say, yes, we're behind you because it's comprehensive. It allows voices to be heard. It allows the impact of what we're doing to see to be real. I know a lot of people say, you don't heard this, but no, this is different. This is different because we've all said we're coming together as one. Because every murder is too real and every life is too important. And then what I say once again, we hurt together, we heal together, we thrive, we live, we grow, we succeed, and we are powerful. I want to thank you, Mayor, for allowing us to kick that off, Solution River. And we're in this together. Thank you very much. standing here and all the brothers who are supporting her are all people who have been uh, very nice to me, have hosted me as I went out into these communities to figure out what was going on. We call it a listening tour because nobody knows better than the community what's going on in the community, right? And they told us what went on and they also came up with some viable solutions. And there are many more in this room that we do want to say thank you to. Also, I want to say thank you to, uh, there's so many people here that uh, have helped tremendously. The work group had leadership from all of the major agencies in the city, and I see some of the commissioners here. A special thank you to Dr. Farley from the health department, so that we came at this from that public health director. But I have to tell you, Dr. Farley, my brother, Bernard Washington, who's chief of epidemiology, we could not have done this without Bernard. Even when I called him at one in the morning, he answered. Uh, and so I want to say thank you to Bernard, especially. Um, I see um, Supervising Judge the Criminal Court Tucker is here. Uh, supporting uh, and is also the chairperson of the CDF, which is phenomenal. I see other judiciary here, Judge Murphy and Judge Oshevsky, uh, and they have that juvenile justice component. Uh, uh, Dr. Height, thank you so much. I know how difficult it was for Dr. Height to come, but the education is a key part of that plan and how we deal with and educate our folks. And I'm only calling out a few people, but I just want you guys to see that everybody is committed to doing this work and working together holistically. So at this time, um, we'll conclude. We have a few minutes if any members of the press have questions. Talk a bit about how you engage the public. You said that you have to engage the public. How do you engage the public and how do they get the So his question was, can I talk a little bit about how we engage the public and what kind of input we got from folks in the community. Initially, my office of violence prevention, I kind of, I call them boots on the ground. They're kind of out there in the street so they know a lot of folks in the different communities. Um, some of it was based on folks who came up to them. Sometimes I got emails or phone calls from people who said, I understand you're in this position. Now, I've only been here six months, but I want to help you, right? I hear you want to do something different. So we would follow up those phone calls and emails or they would identify people. Ultimately, they would pull together community meetings and there would be a variety of folks there from the various communities. So we've been to North Philly, South Philly, uh, one or two places in South Philly, West Philly. Southwest and a few other places, Germantown, other places. We also did targeted focus groups. So we met with trying to get input from young people because that's real important to me and many in the room know I have that kind of child welfare, uh, juvenile justice background. We went to uh, meet with young people who unfortunately are incarcerated and being charged as adults who had gun crimes, did a special focus group with them. We met with the juvenile lifers. These are gentlemen who have served, some of them have served 45 years in jail. Got out recently, that Supreme Court decision um, was done and they really want to help. Met with um, some of the groups in conjunction with the Marist Commission on uh, Youth and uh, some of the high schools and others to get input from there. I don't have them all off the top of my head, but we met with a significant number focused um, to get the information, but also um, across the park. Now, what will come out, um, this is not one and done. It's not a plan that's going on the desk. I know you haven't had time to read it yet. It does contain a governance structure. In that structure is an implementation team, which we plan to get started in February. Continuing meetings to make sure that the plan gets implemented. And part of that is we're going to be doing quarterly meetings with the community and uh, giving a quarterly update on the progress of the plan and the recommendations. But I still have many, many more meetings uh, planned with community folks and other focus groups 
that we're still planning to do. I didn't hear the question. Could you say it one more again? The next one will tell you what it's going to be used for. It's coming from a transfer ordinance uh, that will be introduced to the council. Uh, and then we'll walk through the process of the budget uh, and commit to funding as necessary all of these programs in the next budget. So this will get us through this fiscal year, and then budget address will be March 1st or 2nd. Then we'll go through that budget process and then make sure that the funds are in place for next year. We're having, we'll have that discussion with council on what to get ahead, get ahead of the budgeting process. Council will have their input and their priorities, and we'll base the price tag on, on what we come up with in the end. But the commitment is there for millions of dollars to continue this through for the next five years at least. So just to answer your question on what the $4.4 .4 is being used for, that is because we recognize the urgency of what's going on right now. And so that's this fiscal year. Uh, FY19, so prior to June 30th, the commitment is for $4 million. Um, there is a um, outside funding included in that 4.4 .4 is $2 million from Philadelphia Works committed to workforce development funding, an additional uh, job training, job readiness, and employment contract. So that's $2 million of it. Um, an additional um, targeted, we call them targeted community investment grants. Some folks might call them micro grants. Uh, another uh, $250,000, and already have 250, so let's say 500,000 that will be going into the communities. There are a lot of good organizations and groups who have been doing work in the communities, not getting resourced or funded, that we want to be able to work with so that they can continue the work that they're doing. Um, uh, 2,000 of it is in, uh, money that has been identified from the Department of Public Health who are creating an um, injury prevention unit that will do many things, but also do homicide death review so that we can learn from the additional homicides as many other cities and jurisdictions are doing. Um, there will be an expansion of the community crisis intervention program. $500,000 is headed towards that. We are currently in four areas of the city, but we want to be able to geographically expand. That's the new program that we started in July of 2018. Those um, staffers who work for a CCIP work non-traditional hours and days. They work from Thursday through Sunday, 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. Because when we look at the crime data, those are the times and dates where the crime most occurs. So a $500,000 expansion of that. And also for police technology upgrades, so that we can talk about adding additional surveillance cameras um, and some of the other intel needs so we can begin that process of adding some of the intelligence so that we can uh, take advantage of the intelligence from the police and also community intelligence. And then YBRP, which is the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership, which is a specialized probation and parole um, that uh, identifies those at, highest, those at highest risk of either killing or being killed. Uh, we are in many police districts right now, uh, but we're in several police districts. We'd like to be in more, $250,000 expansion for that with some additional staffing so that we can move into other districts. Uh, so that's, uh, that answers your question in terms of the breakdown. Commissioner, can you talk about what's different about the operation point? What, what's new? Well, admittedly, some of the evidence based stuff is this thing we were doing. What we're doing is kind of collating it all together, particularly as it relates to uh, some of the offender folks. We were doing that, but realizing that we need to drill down even further and really reach out and touch folks. So, just as an example, it's already underway uh, for some, it's not just about stopping people on the street. In fact, that's not even most of it. It's literally about knocking on people's doors who we think are going to be targets. Uh, who may be shooters and literally letting them know of our concern for their well-being and the fact that we are very much aware of their circumstances. So uh, it is a blend of a lot of what we've been doing, using the evidence-based uh, intelligence uh, model. With me here is uh, Chief Inspector Dan McDonald. Uh, what, what we are candidly doing, he is one of the architects of Endpoint. And just to give you uh, a snapshot of who he is, in addition to being an experienced chief inspector, Dan is also a career military uh, guy who has served three tours overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq, where he is an intel officer in the United States Army. 
And so, Dan, I don't know if you just want to speak a little bit about just some of the components without getting too much in the weeds, but we can obviously follow up later about what we're doing relative to training, what we're doing relative to, to some of the more nuanced things that uh, we're implementing in the program. Yeah, the police commissioner established the intelligence bureau that I currently manage about 22 months ago. In that time, we looked at all the policing models that we were currently using and brought in some of the best civilian and police personnel to come in and take a look at the crime problems, identified the best models that were found that different models were from different parts of the city, and then start bringing in data scientists to help us lay this all out. Once we've done that, the police commissioner had us that apply to those models around the city. That's what we're doing now. So it takes all the information that we currently have about crime in the city of Philadelphia, brings it into one location where it's looked at by civilians and police personnel, identify and make predictions on what's going to happen next, and then we let the commanding officers and the patrol districts and the detective bureau deploy early to create interventions or, and prevent this sort of stuff from happening. We're in the early stages now, and it's shown some real good success there, but it's what we've done before in a much more streamlined, faster fashion than we've been able to do in the past. In, 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 um, before you go in there, just one, in, one, one additional thing, I think, and Vanessa outlined the fact that, you know, some of the plan involves getting additional uh, civilian analysts, which is critical. Um, and so we're excited about that uh, for, for two reasons. Um, and, and we can't say enough about, you know, how flexible the men and women uh, and the sworn ranks are in terms of filling those capacities. But civilians will offer an advantage that we, we won't necessarily be able to use with our police officers. One, uh, they do look at things a little different. I mean, most of them have been trained from an educational standpoint to be crime analysts. We have kind of been compelled to force police officers in a multitude of different roles, which they've done in a stellar fashion. In addition to which, with that, is a force multiplier because once you get these people, some of the police officers can now go back and they can work in a different kind of intel capacity that will enable us to put them out on the street in different ways. How is this different from models across the country related to predictive policing? We're using uh, data scientists and surveillance cameras and facial recognition. How is this different? Or are there any? I think there, there's more similarities than there are differences. So I think what you see in law enforcement, first of all, I think like any other industry, whether it be the medical industry or legal, you know, we sit around quarterly, uh, the 70 largest police uh, agencies filled up with one of them, and we talk about, you know, what's the, the, the latest in, in crime uh, analysis and, and what are we doing relative to predictive policing and what technology can you leverage to help you. This is fluid. And so what we try to do is not rest on our laurels recognizing, look, some of you may or may not know, you know, and with regard to evidence-based policing, we've been working on a myriad of projects going back at least six, seven years with Temple University. Foot Beats was one where we, you know, we've got some national recognition on, you know, how well those things can work. So the blend is not necessarily new, but as Dan said, you know, the streamlined focus of it in terms of getting this intel out, as I'm saying, particularly as it relates to Fender focus, really letting people know on the ground, explaining how we can engage people, knowing who they are, particularly before they get involved. Some of you also know, and it sounds like it's a bit, bit off the beaten path, but you know, for us, it's about using a multitude of approaches, not the least of which is even helping people get employment, because we understand those opportunities, and because some of our folks know some of these individuals very well on these corners, they're trying to get them out of harm's way as well. So recognizing that is just many things you have to do. It's not one, um, but we are not in any way resting on our laurels, nor is it something brand new to us with regard to intelligence for let, let it please support that this basically. Just to follow up, are you guys leaving on the table with the idea of using artificial intelligence or facial recognition software in the implementation of this? Well, I mean, artificial intelligence is something we would use in so we already employ facial recognition. And so one of the things that, or some of the many things we're going to be able to do with some of this money is, is again, leveraging technology. Sometimes it's just a matter of improving what you have out there. You know, you heard someone mention about the cameras. We have cameras, and, and arguably, what some don't know, um, this city, although sometimes cash strapped, we've got some it's super bright people. And so under the auspices of Mike Vedro and um, OIT and places like that, he actually built his own cameras that, to me, probably ride with shot spotter that many of you have heard of, where, you know, this is actually tied to the, the audio aspect and the camera spins. We don't have a lot of them. 
these are things that we're looking to increase. So it's not something new in that case. That's something about augmentation and, and enhancement, and that's what we're excited about. Sure. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So one of the aspects of Pinpoint does deal with working with our state and federal partners, uh, particularly our federal partners. They're really excited about uh, partnering with us relative to gun trafficking uh, and dealing with just gun crime. Um, we, we've got a, a new U.S. attorney and William McSwain on board uh, who is um, very, very uh, excited about assisting us, uh, and, and he's really uh, charged his uh, AUSAs as well as the uh, local SACs from the FBI, ATF, DEA, and so forth uh, to really assist us. So we're excited about that because it will involve multiple people and, and multiple entities in order to get this done. Um, trafficking guns is done slightly different than it's been done in years past. Many people may know, you know, the, the days of tractor trailer loads of guns coming and coming. It doesn't even happen that way. The ATF will tell you. You know, whether it be in the form of guns that are stolen from gun shops outside of the city, whether it be in the form of people who legally are licensed to have a gun, but they get them stolen and, and things of that nature. So this is why I have systematically and, and routinely, when I'm speaking to you even, in the mornings when you grab me, um, asking for people who are legally licensed to carry a firearm to make sure that you safeguard that firearm so that it doesn't become an illegal firearm in the hands of someone who shouldn't otherwise possess it. So there, there are a myriad of things that we're doing um, in our, with our partners. I just had a meeting the other day with Attorney General Josh Shapiro, and it happened to be with my pastor, Alan Waller, and some other folks that were present, because it was all about this gun violence. Everybody wants to be a part of it. Everybody knows that they have to play some role. Your role might be very different than the next agency. You could be in a nonprofit. You could be a coach. You know, you could be an employer. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you have to, as you know, Vanessa has done. And, and look, I'm going to do it again. Please just indulge. We'll give her another hand. She worked so hard. <laughs> and so she talked about this, and, and everyone else talked about the need to have a multifaceted approach, and that's what we're going to do. Um, again. You know, a lot of it's not brand new, but you, you always have to figure out just a, a more nuanced way to approach it. And, and I think that's what a lot of it is. But it is about resources, too. It's no, anybody, you know, it was already mentioned before, no one can kid yourself about the fact that you can have the best laid plans in the world. And you touched on the term that we love, boots on the ground. you got to have the boots there, too. The boots aren't always in this uniform. Sometimes it's the form of some of these nonprofit folks who are out there doing this job and going heralded all the time. We do a lot of great work. So, but boots on the ground probably is one of the biggest force multipliers that you got above and beyond anything else. Commissioner, do you, Commissioner, do you see an expansion of the or revival of the focus deterrence program? So that, that's that's a good question. So it's, it's a couple things. Now, number one, uh, you you are well aware, Ms. Burke, that uh, focus deterrence cannot be done without the district deterrence. Otherwise, it's not focus deterrence. We already employ or do some form of that in the form of uh, pinpoint anyway, and even prior to that. But remember that it becomes more for us, more stick and carrot. And so you want uh, that multifaceted approach. I keep saying that for a reason. And so you you got to talk to the district attorney about, you know, what his level of interest is. Um, but remember, too, when it comes to focusing on individuals, we have to be somewhat uh, tactical, strategic about how we do it because with focus deterrence, the people are on probation. And thus lies the ability to pull people in for those calls that you are invariably know about. And so with us, you know, we have to just use our intel to make contact with these people, knock on doors, nothing illegal about that just to say we're concerned about you. But that's not focus deterrence in the, in the aspect that you're alluding to. So we are not opposed to anything like that, but just understand that we cannot do something like that unilaterally. We would need the district attorney, and then you, you know, we would have to sit down and decide where that works most appropriately. It was a reason why we, uh, some years back, decided to do that in South Philadelphia because the gangs that uh, involved were so structured, uh, and we knew exactly who fights who all the time, uh, and so it worked well there. There are other places that we think it could work. Um, it may not work in others, but again, I think the important thing to underscore is that we're open to just about anything. 
And, and, and again, whether it be my conversation with Eddie Johnson in Chicago, Mike Moore in LA, or Jimmy O'Neill in NYPD, these are conversations that are fluid. They're happening, they happen with us, and uh, we're always looking for new ways to do different things, and, and that's the problem. We have time for one more question. Wonderful things that happen in the midst 
of crazy. Because this is true. This is hard. But when you have that happen, something, something should work, and it will work. We're talking about saving lives, opening doors, like you said, so that we all work as one. Work and, and, and work. Because we can have we can have a thousand ideals, and we are leaders all across the city. But respecting each other, saying what you're doing there is working well, we need to help you do that. And so I think that's that's part of this initiative. And so getting that to change the facet, yes, but also using changing the environment, buildings that are not being used, allowing us to have access to them, changing the environment, not only language-wise, but the way they see it, an opportunity, investing in the spirit. We're talking about the spirit of the person, changing the spirit. And that only happens when you take out some of the trauma, infuse them with some hope, have them see a future, not realize that they live for the moment, but that they can live what their moment should be, helping them dream again. And that can happen. 